Welcome back, everyone. This is the Coverage Your Podcast. I am your host, Nick Lamparelli. I am in Coverage Your Headquarters in Naples, Florida, where we measure time by how many haircuts I'm getting. So this is uh, COVID haircut number four. That's how we do it here. Um, and so I'm excited to have this particular conversation because continuing on with the theme that we've been having on wellness and health and uh, just that overall theme when it comes to insurance. Um, I have a full chalked panel here where we're going to talk about it. Uh, Veer Gidiwani. Did I pronounce Gidwani. that right? You got it. You just about got it. Well done. Gidwani. Okay. Veer Gidwani, Scott Grandma, and Mike Zarillo. We're going to be talking about wellness and health and things like that. So, um, I start off all of these guys by allowing the guests to uh, just give a little bit of an elevator pitch on who you are and what you do. Um, you guys have a different Brady Bunch uh, cubes than I do. So I'm going to go clockwise, which means Mike Zarillo, who's right underneath me, Mike, then Scott, then Veer. Introduce yourself. Who are you and what, what do you do? Awesome. Well, thanks. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm Mike Zarillo, uh, Chief Revenue Officer here at Brella and uh, joined the organization in, uh, I guess it was March of uh, this past year uh, to help get our, uh, our company launched and, and off the ground. Uh, in the great time to join. My goodness. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've been known for uh, good timing in, in my <laughs> life. Uh, but uh, yeah, I joke um, it'll be sweeter in the end, right? Because yeah. of uh, uh, the hard work it takes to get here. Um, I joined, quite simply uh, because I've spent 22 or so years now on what I'll call the traditional or uh, dinosaur insurance company uh, side of our, of our business and to have a chance to uh, join an early stage organization who's hyper-focused on the consumer first and solving a real problem uh, second was uh, a no-brainer for me. So uh, good to be here and um, excited to share a little bit more about what we're doing at Brella with you. Thanks, Mike. Scott? Hi, I'm Scott Grandma. Uh, happy to be on the podcast as well. Big fan of yours, Nick. Uh, happy oh. to be uh, actually live in uh, the front row seat here. Um, I currently lead the Greenhouse Life Organization. I've uh, been with RGAX since its inception about five years ago. Have broadly been in the innovation space most of my career, having uh, worked in underwriting at uh, Carriers for in excess of two decades, largely working in uh, new initiatives, largely working in underwriting, product development, and carrying that forward here at RGX has really been uh, just really the icing on the cake relative to my career. And in Cantor, getting to work with a team like this at Brella has been uh, just a real delight. You know, we're doing some meaningful work here and uh, happy to have a role relative to that. Fantastic. Veer? Great, thanks for having us, Nick. We appreciate it. Um, my name is Veer Gidwani. I'm CEO and founder here at Brella and have been an entrepreneur for about 22 years since I prematurely left college. Um, and my last company, Maxwell Health, was in the HR and benefits space. So certainly had an opportunity to uh, learn firsthand some of the challenges that people face with respect to benefits. Uh, that company was acquired by Sun Life in 2018 and excited to be uh, building Brella. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So I should have I started that way as well and just talked about the two companies uh, from my, the, that the panel represent are Brella and RGAX. Although, Scott, you have, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the greenhouse uh, element of that. But uh, that's essentially it, which is uh, Brella. Uh, I'm, I want to get into the Brella element of it. But for those that do have listened to my podcast in the past, you probably are aware of RGAX, which is a uh, large global, uh, predominantly life and life reinsurer. And so um, coming in and the RGAX element of RGA, I said, I think I said that right. The RGAX element is the innovation element of RGA. Um, and so that's, that's going to be very important as we kind of uh, work through this particular agenda. Um, so Veer, I want to I wanna start with you. I want, uh, you, you are an entrepreneur by, uh, sounds like DNA, um, but you've, you've got a few under your belt now. So 
Can you uh, tell me why Brella was formed? What did you see that was underserved in the market? Because you were at a health organization just before this. So what was missing that a company like Brella needed to be formed? Yeah. So let me start off by just giving you a sense of what our mission is and then work backwards as to why that matters. Uh, our mission is to make sure that health distress doesn't result in financial distress. And you know, I think the unfortunate reality is that for the vast majority of middle-class families in the country, if they were to have an unforeseen medical event, uh, it would almost certainly lead to some level of financial distress. And the reason is because the um, unfortunate economics of healthcare um, put people in this position. And when you look at what the um, average deductible or out-of-pocket access for a family medical plan, that deductible is in the you know, $3,500 range. Uh, when you look at the uh, cost, if you were to be hospitalized and what that would likely uh, end up costing you as a consumer, and you put that in the context of what most families can actually afford. So what sort of liquid cash do they have available to deal with said emergency? The math doesn't really add up. Uh, and so the unfortunate reality is, is that if you, you know, come down with pneumonia or if your kid breaks their ankle or God forbid you have a heart attack, not only are you gonna be dealing with um, that health issue, but you're also gonna have uh, a financial challenge. And in our view, uh, look, the first order problem, of course, is to get the cost of care down in America. Uh, in absence of that, uh, we need to make sure that there are financial instruments that are available so that people can deal with those shocks. Uh, and so when we looked at this space of supplemental insurance, broadly speaking, what became apparent to us is that the products that have existed in this arena for the last 30 years critical illness, accident insurance, hospital indemnity, um, really of, of lost product market fit in our view. And you see this in the numbers. Um, the vast majority of companies don't even offer a supplemental policy. Even when they do, the enrollment rates are very low. But conceptually, what these products are intending to do is very useful. They pay out a lump sum amount of cash if you get sick or injured. And that's what Brella does as well. But what makes Brella unique is the sheer breadth of conditions that we cover, over 13,000, which makes Brella the most comprehensive supplemental product that has ever been created. Uh, and the reason we designed it that way is that, you know, we want to make sure that it's a useful product that um, people will actually utilize because of the breadth of what it covers and the ability it has to help people offset those financial challenges when they get sick or injured. Where did the product market fit break down? Is it because um, the products that you mentioned um, were too siloed and couldn't expand? Or it, was it just a question of, um, as, you, as you mentioned, like tens of thousands of different elements could trigger a claim? Did it just need to be bundled more and just needed to evolve better? How, how did it break down? Yeah, there, there are three, three things that really stood out for us and Mike should certainly jump in on this. He's an expert at it as well. Um, one is that traditionally, if you wanted to have comprehensive supplemental coverage, which first of all, let's all admit, conceptually is not something that the average person walks around thinking about. No. But if you knew you needed it, um, you would have to buy three or four different products today. Okay. You know, after you've bought medical insurance, dental, vision, life, disability insurance during open enrollment to say to the consumer, here are four more products you need to buy to fill the gaps on the five you just bought. Um, it's a pretty ridiculous um, thing to put forth. So that, that's the first thing. Uh, and related to that, I mean, how are people supposed to predict um, what emergency that was unforeseen that they're going to have? Is it going to be an illness? Is it going to be an accident? Is it going to be something that causes you to be hospitalized? Obviously, we don't know. Uh, so to force someone into that choice uh, is really problematic. Next uh, is that these products traditionally have been very vanilla. They're in no way personalized to the specific needs of the consumer. Uh, and when you think of this conceptually, the product should adapt to what your medical plan covers, and they should adapt to what you as an individual or a family can afford. 
uh, the products that have existed traditionally don't do that. They don't know much about the consumer. They don't adapt themselves to the consumer's needs. They don't really personalize themselves. Uh, and finally, is, is, and you highlighted on this, is the, is the breadth of what we cover. Um, you know, Brella covers three to four times more than what traditional products cover, even when you combine them. Um, so it, it's just a, a far more useful benefit to consumers. Yeah. Mike? Yeah, you know, and I think I would add to that, um, and it's a bit of sort of playing on what Veer said around just the sheer number of products available to an employee in the typical enrollment today. You know, the, the traditional products, there's three or four of those that make up some sort of wide or comprehensive coverage. Um, but how, how would an employee sort of, in our mind, um, sort of understand how they all work, understand how they connect to the overall uh, benefits offering and, and specifically how they connect to the medical insurance. You know, Veer took you through a very common menu, starting with medical, dental, vision, life, disability, and then all the voluntary stuff. Well, it's the voluntary stuff like supplemental health products that should be right up next to the medical product so that an employee making that buying decision understands how it connects to the, um, to, to the health insurance. So, the other piece to our thesis here is when you talk about product market fit with traditional carriers is they're misaligned with the most important component, and that's the health insurance. It's impossible to get if you're an employee. Uh, first, it's an impossible decision. It's an unfair decision. And the vast majority of employees don't, don't buy multiple products. So um, an employer who gets the need for supplemental health insurance that decides to offer these benefits um, they're just too far down the menu. They're too much of an afterthought. They're not part of that sort of core yeah. decision-making process. And that's where, the, that's where it becomes really difficult for employees to make that educated and informed decision. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself in the employee's shoes. So, I mean, I think uh, November or October is generally the, the month of the year where these things that, you know, the benefits kick in and you want to plan uh, for the next year. So, um, I, I don't know a lot about this space and I'm in, I'm supposed to be an insurance expert. If those things came offered to me, I think I would just glance over and say, I I'm covered. I got health insurance. Tell me yeah, why I'm wrong. It's, it's, I mean, I know why I'm wrong, but ex explain, explain the disconnect in, in um, how this stuff is actually communicated to the employees because it seems like there's a gaping hole in their, um, in their protection. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And, and lifting off of what Mike said, the connection to the health insurance is really crucial. So if you were to go to the average person today and say, hey, tell me what about your benefits you least like. Other than the cost of premiums, most people will say the deductible they have on their health insurance is well beyond what they can afford. Now we accept it because uh, the only way to keep premiums down is to accept a higher deductible. And so year after year for the past decade, that's been one of the tools that employers have had, had no choice but to use in order to keep premiums down for their employees. Um, but if you, if you dig into that uh, response, look, these deductibles are beyond what I can afford, mm -hmm. Brella is a perfect solution for that. Because what we're essentially saying is that if you were forced to spend a big part of that deductible because of an emergency, Brella is here to offset that unforeseen expense. Whereas today, voluntary products aren't positioned with that simplicity, partly because they're not simple. Um, yeah. the, the idea that there's several solutions to select or products to select that are sort of point in their nature, uh, they don't cover very much, claims denial rates are relatively high. It's tough to you know, back those products with a level of confidence that says they're really good at what they do. Um, and when that's lacking, you know, on top of it, the complexity, it's really hard to connect the dots for the average person. So we come to the table and say, look, here's a simple product that covers a lot more, and it's directly connected with offsetting the most concerning thing you have about your medical insurance. How do you, so how do you do that? I, I'm, and it, my, my health insurance is a disaster, right? Like I, I've, I have no idea what my co-pays are, when they are, just not it's not something I want to focus on. I think that happens with a lot of people as well. So can you, can you tell us a little bit, um, Mike or Veer, uh, 
talk about like, how do you do that? How can you make it um, dovetail? And I th maybe that's the right word, dovetail to the health insurance plan that these companies might offer. Mike? Yeah, it's a good question. I was, I was speaking with a, uh, a broker partner recently around our product and, and um, this particular individual has done some, some uh, business in the critical illness, accident, hospital indemnity space. And he asked, what, what, what do you refer to your product as? And I said, supplemental health insurance. And he said, no, I mean, I, I get that, but what's, you know, it, there's critical illness, there's accident, there's hospital indemnity. I said, no, supplemental health insurance. We're not, we're not accident. So I think the, 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 at the foundation, the structure and design of our plan just on its own is, is meant to be a natural complement to the health insurance discussion. So uh, trying to have the average employee figure out what's, what is a critical illness, what's an accident, how does it all work back to that, that point I made earlier is, is, uh, is a bit challenging. The other piece to this though is the experience um, from enrollment all the way through utilization of these benefits. Now in our world, you know, it, it takes a village, right? It takes the insurance provider it takes the insurance broker and it takes the employer to all come together, get in sync and understand that we all serve the employee at the end of that process. So um, whether it be, you know, working closely to develop an enrollment plan and strategy so that communication is crisp, is clear, product placement naturally flows from health insurance to Brella or to a supplemental health product and then down the line. Um, but I, I, I think the other piece to that, as I sort of alluded to, is the utilization, right? Being able to, to sort of explain and, and demonstrate how easy it is to use a product like Brella. And I'll let Veer sort of take it, take it from here. Um, but that's only made possible when you can simplify the insurance product like, like we've done. Yeah. Veer? Yeah, to, to, to add to that, uh, you know, one, we've built a recommendation engine into Brella that, you know, with two or three responses to simple questions about your health insurance or your savings profile, your family profile, we can tailor a version of our product to you um, right on the fly. Uh, so that, that's one element. Second element, and, and you know, this is something that has been really near and dear to us as we thought about building Brella, was to innovate on the insurance product itself and not just the technology and the go-to-market strategy around that insurance product. Um, so as an insure tech company, we're as much about the insurer as we are about the tech. And in this particular space, um, you know, sort of a, a bottoms up rebuild of the product was really important. And one element of that rebuild was how we think of a valid claim. Uh, and this gets really towards the experience. So one of the things that's unique about Brella is the fact that the only piece of evidence we need to assess whether a claim is valid is proof of a diagnosis. And the beauty of that is that it allows the consumer through our app to give us evidence of their diagnosis that they would likely receive at the point of care, whether it be a set of x-rays, the wristband they're wearing from the ER, uh, discharge papers, they can literally take a photograph of those and submit them to us. From that kind of evidence, we can assess the diagnostic code and trigger a payment. And the way that Brella's designed today, within 72 hours, we can have a claim paid. We expect that within a couple of years, that'll be down to seconds for the vast majority of claims, automating that experience almost entirely. On the other hand, if you look at the incumbents today who um, do not pay on diagnosis, and as a result need you to um, present a bill that you might have received, which, which possibly was only something you received many days or weeks after leaving the hospital, by definition, they're not able to get you a payment until many weeks after yeah. the expense was incurred. And so by then your credit card was due, your rent was due, and the cash flow crunch already hit. Uh, Brella is, is completely distinct from that from an experiential perspective. And part of it is driven by insurance innovation on top of technology innovation. I, I can tell you that um, I find the entire health process extremely frustrating in the amount of paperwork bills that get sent and then the amount of time that it takes to um, basically figure out what are they talking about here? What, what doctor's visit was this? Why am I being charged this? Oh, they're billing me because the insurance company hasn't sent them the check yet. 
and then having to continuously follow up on that, it's, it's, um, it's extremely messy and frustrating from, from my side. And so, um, Scott, I'm wondering from your end, um, you hear this, you hear this pitch from this company called Brella. What are you thinking? I'm thinking engagement, Nick. Um, I got very excited when I first heard the pitch about a year and a half ago from Veer. Um, to me, working in the, the innovation space and hearing pitches that are a mile wide in terms of promise, but very, very shallow in terms of delivery, yep. this was a fresh look at resetting the narrative with the consumer. Did, what Scott, I found, Scott did, you, did you know there was this particular problem? Were you aware of it or um, did you become aware of it as, as they went into it? No, I'm an individual life insurance guy. That's my area of expertise. Yeah. You know, much like everybody else on this call and in our audience, my experience is through the lens of being a consumer, understanding the problem, chasing after my HSA, trying to get a copy of the bill. You know, so it spoke to me when I listened to the vision for the team. You know, so I was, drew, I was drawn in immediately with that idea that this is addressing a real problem. You know, it's not talking about a fancy delivery mechanism for a state old product that's trying to continue living. It's solving a new problem. And it solves a problem in a way that I think is very accessible to non-insurance people. You know, explaining it to my wife is just like, Ooh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. I'd love to have something. That's how I feel right now. It, exactly. Yeah. So there was that immediacy of it to me. So once you get engaged on a topic like that, I mean, you start thinking about the block and tackle work necessary to get this project down the field. So the excitement and the understanding was uh, real visceral to me right out of the gate. And if I can, if I can add to that from what Scott just mentioned. I mean, um, <clears throat> the vast pre-COVID, if you were to ask the average American, um, do you think if you had a medical emergency that it would cause you financial hardship? Most people would probably answer, yeah, probably it would. In the COVID era, if you asked that same question, virtually everybody would look at you as if you had um, just sort of missed out what happened over the last nine months. <laughs> Clearly a health emergency that's unexpected can lead to significant financial distress. 62% of personal bankruptcies in the US are due to the accumulation of medical debt. You know, millions of people have contributed to GoFundMe campaigns for absolute strangers raising money for medical bills. Um, you know, whether you believe in a single payer system or not is aside, but literally half the country is open to the idea of a single payer medical system. So to us, these are, these are indications of the fact that people can't afford healthcare. And they're yeah. afraid that if they have something happen to them, it's gonna cause real problem. And, and that, you know, that's the problem we're trying to solve, which is not something that's novel. Um, most people can relate to that issue. Sorry, Mike, I think you were going to hop in. No, 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 no. I, I, I just want to add on to that, right? That 62% number of, of uh, personal bankruptcies caused by, you know, the, the accumulation of medical debt, that, that's not necessarily a new statistic. What's an interesting one, though, to your point, post-COVID in July, um, Gallup West did a, uh, a study and 50% um, of U.S. adults fear bankruptcy, right? There's very different, that 62% number is the actual bankruptcies that have occurred, but we've got half of the U.S. population right now fears bankruptcy. It's just a really disheartening stat when you think about it. And when I think about the incumbents, and I spent a lot of time in that space, um, you know, the, the traditional products, they, they seem to be geared towards those, those really big ticket events, the heart attacks, the cancers, the strokes. Now, listen, th those are devastating for, for everybody, um, certainly financially. Um, but that same study that was done in July indicated that about 26% of adults would have to borrow the money needed to pay a $500 unexpected medical um, bill. Think about that for a second. We're not talking tens of thousands of dollars. We're talking about a four and a $500 medical expense. So when we look to build our product, again, through the lens of the consumer and their experience and the challenges that they're facing. Yes, heart attack, stroke, cancer is, you know, certainly devastating. But for some, some people, so is the kidney stone and the dehydration, right, on the other end of the spectrum of severity. Um, it, it's, it's just too wide to focus on just the, the, the high dollar uh, end of that. Right. 
uh, and I will, um, my background is in property casualty. And I always say theoretically, there's an alignment of interest between a policyholder and a carrier or reinsurer in that no one really wants a claim, right? Um, but there's a whole bunch of reasons why that sort of breaks down. I think of my health insurance and um, I, it, it seems like everything breaks down in, in how all of that works. For one thing, I don't actually know what I'm covered for. I think, I think I'm covered for a lot, but my guess is that I'm only getting, I'm only paying the copay for these visits that I go, but if something significant happened, I'm probably not nearly as covered as I think I'm covered. Right. And I think that that probably goes for most healthcare plans. Am I wrong? No, I, I think that's right. And I think that comes back to some of that literacy around benefits, certainly when it comes to health insurance, it's hard, it's complex, it's right. not easy stuff. Um, so so and I want, for the, I, yep. yeah, I think there's, I think there's a, um, there's a breakdown in that there should be an alignment of interest between the two parties, right? But it kind of breaks down. It's almost like a conflicting relationship. They feel as though they feel as though they can't use it or they're going to, they don't want to use it because they don't know what the outcome is. But in fact, um, there, there almost should be some encouragement to use it to be proactive on things like preventative care, you know, to prevent the big things from happening, you know, small, small uh, wellness, small health uh, preventative actions can prevent that big thing from occurring. And there almost feels like there's a disincentive to do that. Well, I think, I think related to that is that no matter how healthy we try to live, um, things happen. You know, some of these things are not because we live unhealthy. They're, they're because we're human beings and life is complicated. And um, there are lots of things that can go wrong when it comes to one's health. Uh, think of all the accidents that we might have that are not because of reckless living, right? They're, uh, they're, they're because there's just something happens That's to true. you. It's, it's the reality of it. Um, you know, I, I think what's unique about Brella, what we've been trying to make as core to our philosophy is the idea that we're built to say yes. Now, there's, there's an original philosophy around insurance that, that often gets you know, tangled up in the modern world of insurance. That when insurance was created um, you know, hundreds, a couple hundred years ago, the, co the concept was that a community of people would pool their funds so that in an emergency for a small portion of that pool of people, they'd be able to rely on the community's yeah. collective wealth to solve a problem. Um, insurance is still that today. We just don't think of it that way philosophically. And Brella has really tried to reconnect itself to that core of what insurance is about. So we're built to say, yes, we are not trying to find a way to minimize the claims we receive. We are not trying to find a way to have language that will you know, make it only possible to get a claim in a very specific situation. We are trying by design to pay out as often as we physically can um, because we want to make sure people use this product. That is the point of it. Yep. Um, you know, it's, it's an odd term when you think of a loss ratio, right? We as insurers think of a loss ratio. Well, that loss ratio is actually the point of the product, right? Uh, maybe we should think about it as the value ratio. What value is this insurance product delivering to its consumer? That's really central to how we think of Brella and why we designed it to cover so much. You know, a good example, obviously one that's topical for all of us is what's going on with COVID. And if you were hospitalized for COVID, uh, you know, there are 100,000 Americans in hospitals today because of COVID. Um, in the vast majority of cases, they would have also likely have been diagnosed with pneumonia, sepsis, or acute respiratory failure. As it turns out, those three conditions are not covered today by the vast majority of sup supplemental health products. No. So, what are they missing? You know, when we designed Brella, we didn't design it for a global pandemic. We designed it last summer before COVID existed. But when we asked ourselves the question, when we asked this thousands of times as we went through every single diagnostic code that exists, we asked ourselves, taking pneumonia as an example, if you had pneumonia, would you expect a product with our mission statement to pay? 
And if the answer is yes, then you pay. It's very yeah. simple. You cover that condition. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that purity is, I hope, a new bar we set for uh, others in this space. But more importantly, is really value that that people see and they think of Brella as an important part of, of their overall benefits um, makeup. Yeah. S Scott, can you talk about the um, evolution of how RGAX, um, you, you know, what your uh, element was in participating in this and getting it from idea to um, having a say on, you know, um, how the risk should be backed all the way to, um, you know, go to market strategies and things like that. Talk, talk about the beginning. Cause it, it's a good mission, right? Even you were kind of like, yeah, that's, that kind of hits home, but a mission's one thing. Now we got to get it. We, it's got to stand on its own at one point uh, or at some point in the future, talk about that uh, span of time and what had to occur in the background to sort of backfill that the consumer that's benefiting from this, they never get to see it because they've been, it's been abstracted away. That's a great question, Nick. And in all candor, I could probably spend about an hour and 23 minutes talking about just this. It was a great journey from the very opening where we started talking about thinking about the new narrative with the consumer. You know, this was all about putting that consumer right in the middle of the conversation, weaving a product, a delivery mechanism, and an experience around that that was completely new. Um, as you know, product development, innovation generally is something that takes a little bit of muscle memory, takes internal alignment, takes commitment. When you're talking about building against something that doesn't exist, you have to have somebody that's around that that is effectively the veer on the inside of the operation, who's architecting some of the uh, solutions internally, evangelizing around the innovation, and just really wrapping duct tape around things at times. You know, we had to work cohesively across the enterprise, be it pricing folks or underwriting folks in our group operation, our claim subsidiary, our team. I mean, all of these things had to be there anyways. But when you're talking about something that you completely take off the whiteboard because there is no surrogate for it in market, it, it really kind of galvanizes people to sit up and pay attention. Like, no, no, this is worth solving for the reasons we've been talking about for a year and a half. So to me, there was a lot of challenges. There was a lot of shuttle diplomacy. There was a lot of a fair hat in hand. Can we have a talk? <laughs> um, and similarly with some of our pricing folks or some of our claims folks and really trying to forge something that didn't exist before. Those are challenges that just make the work rewarding. And when you finally get that across that finish line and get it launched in market, you look around and say, good God, I can't wait to see how this does over time, right? Yeah. You know, and that to me is that the value in being in an innovative organization and supporting partners like this. Can you, can you guys talk about some of the um, background elements of this? So ultimately, is, is Brella considered an insurance carrier or is, the, or is the risk being handled elsewhere? I'll jump in on that one. Uh, Greenhouse is the paper for this. Okay. We reinsure with our parent company, RGA Re, and uh, that's how we're able to get a partner like Brella to market. And uh, once in market, uh, the world's their oyster. Now, this this has elements to it that I've that I've seen elsewhere, right? Like this almost seems like if you can execute here. This seems like a springboard where you could then extend this out to beyond supplemental health insurance and just basically make it health, right? It's like the whole thing. Is that a plan for this? Right now we are laser focused on solving this one problem, which in and of itself is a big and difficult problem. Um, and we want to do it really well. So I think part of that is is having focus uh, and not complicating uh, what you're trying to do. So the answer to your question is no. <laughs> we are <laughs> focused on this problem uh, alone. Now, uh, today, this product is only available in Texas. That was the state in which we decided to launch. Our expectation over the next you know, 12 to 18 months is to become available largely nationwide. 
Um, you know, one of the things that's been really important to us, and you know, Mike and I are just the spokespeople here for a team of folks, um, both within Brella, but we have partners in addition to RGX who've all helped bring this to life. Um, but all of us have been um, really lasered in on, on creating this experience that Mike talked about. And part of it is to control a lot of the elements. Um, the entire platform behind Brella um, has been built by Brella. You know, obviously there's other software that we use, but we've not outsourced our software platform. Um, we have not gone and found someone else to do customer service. Um, we've built the concierge operation with Umbrella. Uh, we do all our underwriting, we do all our own claims, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And part of the realization there is that if you wanna create a really tight experience that um, focuses on delivering the most value to the consumer, then you do need to be willing to get your arms around the entire journey mm -hmm. uh, and influencing um, you know, from end to end, which has been really core to our uh, whole philosophy here at Brella from day one. So um, what does it take to go from one state to a nationwide thing? How, how, what is the regulatory environment? Is this also a state by state thing? And is supplemental health insurance regulated in the same way that regular health insurance is regulated? So it is regulated state by state um, within the insurance commissions. And, um, you know, there's good precedence for a product like Brella. Uh, we've talked about other supplemental products that have existed for, you know, two, three decades. Uh, you know, what we've realized from our experience, we have, again, a team of folks who've, who've um, filed products nationwide uh, in the arena of health. You know, at the end of the day, state insurance commissioners want to bring value to their constituents, the citizens of the state. And the problem we're solving is so clearly dealing with an issue that is very real for the vast majority of people. Uh, so, you know, yes, there may be questions about our approach and how we're pulling it all together, uh, but ultimately we, um, we work with world experts when it comes to pricing this product. Um, we've designed it in a way that um, follows all the regulatory frameworks that exist. Uh, it's a new way to solve the problem uh, and we've constituted it in a different kind of product. So yeah, I expect that um, we'll get a positive perception uh, in the vast majority of places that we wanna take this product to. And, and um, you know, so far the reception has been really positive. Can this, um, can this product, I know it's right now being uh, delivered on, on uh, at the distribution angle via employee benefits uh, to, so are there two other potential distribution elements to this? Could you go direct to consumer or could with this really massive surge into wellness, could this product be sold into the wellness communities? Mike, do you want to take that? Yeah, sorry, audio uh, audio <laughs> issue there. It's Zoom. Um, I, I think the answer is yes and yes. So to Veer's point, we're, we're hyper-focused now on the group side of, of our product and product design. Um, but from a roadmap perspective, uh, we absolutely see the direct-to-consumer uh, channel as, as one that uh, makes sense and that we should continue to, uh, to focus in on as we, uh, as we continue to grow and expand. Um, I, I think the, the wellness... Uh, example that you shared sort of falls into this area of what, what I'll call strategic partnerships. And, uh, you know, I think there's many constituents in the benefit space that touch the consumer in some form or fashion um, that uh, it may make sense for us to think about um, some sort of partnership or alliance to get in front of the consumer in uh, potentially a joint way to augment that experience, um, something obviously we're, we're very focused uh, focused on. Um, and I think post COVID candidly, Nick, is gonna shine a new light on a lot of this uh, as we go forward. Uh, there's just a greater focus on um, health and benefits. Uh, certainly employees are gonna expect more and demand more. I don't think the core focus of benefits being a uh, tool to attract and retain key employee talent is ever gonna go away. So. I think it's going to continue to challenge us as product manufacturers, as administrators, as carriers 
to make sure that we are continuing to innovate in a space on the insurance side that hasn't seen a lot of innovation. Mike, does just, it, just oh, so go, go, go Edvir, continue on. No, I was just going to lift off something that Mike had said is that, um, you know, one other element of broadly speaking distribution opportunity here is that, you know, for good or bad, the benefits in this space have been typically um, collectively referred under the banner of voluntary, which is an, an odd categorization. But what it essentially means is that the employer doesn't contribute to the to the premiums of the benefit, the employee is paying for 100% of it. Now, you have to ask yourself why that's been the case. Why haven't employers funded benefits in this space? And would they be willing to contribute to the premium if you offered a product that was better uh, and was actually going to be utilized because it covers so much more? So part of what we are um, experiencing as we speak to brokers, we speak to employers is, is an interest that is, is leaning towards, you know, maybe this is something we should contribute to because if we as an employer contribute to this benefit, more people will buy it, which will mean that they're less likely to face financial distress um, if something were to happen, which will by and large um, rub off well on the medical plan because it's gonna make that have more value to the consumer and overall it's a better benefits package. So um, we definitely wanna um, pursue the channel we're in right now because you know, as Mike said earlier on, uh, this is supplemental health insurance. So buying it alongside your health insurance and it being part of that economic decision makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, there's lots of ways to take this to market and I expect we will pursue many of them. Uh, but but uh, we also just want to make sure that we're, we're really illustrating the value proposition in a way that's in the context of your overall benefits needs as a as a individual or family. Yeah. And, and there's, um, there's a work from home element now that, you know, Mike, to your point, I think COVID clearly has changed everything, right? But to sort of pile on to that, the work from home element now makes it extremely complicated because, um, I, you know, I know in, in my company on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we've actually had conversations about people are working from home and they're stressed out. They're probably working more now than they have. And like, we have to remind them to drink water, you know, get up and stuff like that. Like that is a, that is a significant departure from normal day-to-day -day business activity with your labor force, especially the office force who's used to going, you know, commuting going into an office. I, I know uh, th there's, there's a term, water cooler talk, getting up, going to the bathroom, going to the water cooler, having a conversation. Like there was a lot of productive networking and collaboration that went on with that that has disappeared with the work from home. And we may not get that for a long time. And so there's a mental strain on the employee now in a work from home. So uh, th that's kind of like a throw out question to all three of you. There's, there's the element of like the world has changed peace and that employers should be looking to be more proactive. Right. But then there's the other element of, you know, to, to Brella's point, if you're in Texas and you start rolling out state by state, what if it's the company in Texas that has a work at home work from home employee in Hawaii? Like, how does, how does that get arranged? How does that work? Yeah, I, I'll start. I, I mean, if you think about, again, all of the stakeholders in this equation, uh, you know, we all have to think a little differently in the, in the world that we're in. And it starts with, you know, how are benefits communicated? How do employees uh, engage in those benefits, right? That's, we just came through, we're in the midst of or sort of the back end of fourth quarter and the open enrollment cycle. And, you know, gone are the days of benefit fairs and, and in-person group meetings and on-site enrollers. Um, so how are employees making heads or tails of all of their benefits and, and understanding them? You know, so simplicity is better. Um, I think the, the other piece here is if you think about the reason we're in this sort of work from home environment back to the pandemic and COVID and this refocusing on benefits and how am I covered and what am I covered for and, and how does it work and, 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 and all of that, it's just a complete uh, shift in, in many ways on, on how benefits are going to be consumed by employees. So as stakeholders in this, I think we all play a part in making that experience 
as, as positive and, and as easy as it can be. And I keep coming back to simplicity, right? The, the, you know, the, the best way to get employees engaged is make it easy, make it simple, right? Because they've got so many other things going on to make heads or tails of. Um, so I, I, I think you're right, Nick. And I think it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to force us to sort of relook at the world around us. And, you know, I feel like we have in a unique position here at Brella because we've built our entire foundation on simplicity. We built the entire foundation on the consumer to, to Scott's point earlier, where, you know, some of those traditional or incumbent carriers, um, you know, have some work to do candidly to, uh, to make that shift. So we feel like we've got a really good start on that. And, uh, um, you know, I'll let Veer sort of chime in or Scott from here, but um, I think it's a great question. Yeah, those are, those are all um, excellent points, Mike. And I, I think the other thing is that, you know, hundreds of thousands of businesses across the country um, are also having a very hard time making it work. Uh, and they also need to go through the annual benefits process still. And, you know, whether they want to be in benefits or not is separate from the fact that the vast majority of American employers have a role to play in benefits. And so as, as budgets get further crunched, um, getting enough value out of the benefit dollar you're spending is going to be, it has always been an important question, but it's becoming an even more urgent question. So, you know, being able to rethink of benefits, um, to be able to reallocate how those dollars are spent to optimize the value for the employee, I think is a, a reality that many employers will face. And there's going to need to be some innovation around insurance to make that happen. It, it won't just be around technology. Um, it won't just be about better process. I mean, it'll be some of those things for sure, but it will also be because of better insurance products. And I think the burden is on the industry to rethink about their products a bit and figure out, is there a better way to do this that is gonna benefit people? Scott, to the point of sort of rethinking it, um, I not only have one smart device that I got to help me with my wellness, I got two. Oh, goodness. <laughs> okay. Because, uh, you know, fill in the gaps type of thing. And so from an innovation standpoint, how, do, how are you viewing uh, companies like Brella and, and um, what's your expectation for them to evolve as this is? Uh, what, can, think of it like a crystal ball. How do you see this crystal ball? How do you, what's your, what's your desire or hope that uh, that kind of plays out with the, um, these sort of startup tech companies that are coming into the space and, you know, really re rethinking the customer, which is phenomenal because we haven't done that a lot, but um, putting emphasis on uh, simplicity, putting emphasis on technology and all of that. What's, what are your hopes and desires? That's an excellent question, Nick, and I'll uh, throw a few comments at it here and invite the group to support those comments. Um, as I look at Brella, and I've seen them uh, mature over the past, uh, the better part of 16, 17 months at this point, and beginning to grow in market, the thing that I'm looking to see here is maturing some of our underlying premise around customer engagement, market product fit, and service, right? Right now, these are all still small uh, you know, plays for us. I'd like to see this thing grow. I'd like to get to a point where we think in terms of resetting that narrative and other product lines. We all struggle with activating consumers, no matter what protection product you're selling. If we could think about it through the framework of how Borella is engaged that, right? Start with the pocketbook, start with the hazards that people are subjected to and work back from that problem statement and work through it methodically. Don't reach too quickly for a solution off the shelf. Rethink it through the lens of how do I not only get that pitch out to that consumer, but mature that pitch all the way through continual support and claims payment. If you think about it from that perspective, there is no part of the market you shouldn't be able to unlock. So the future for me is thinking through the lens of Brella's success as a market and seeing if you can replicate some of the magic around activating that consumer creating a market solution that provides value for those people or the gatekeepers or the carrier, right? All of those constituents need to be harmonized in these solutions. How do we rethink that kind of thing through the lens of 
the right product fit, the right technologies and the right approaches. Yeah. So um, let's finish it off this way. Can we do a, a round of 2021 uh, predictions? What do you, how, 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 aside from the obvious that, uh, you know, the vaccines work and COVID kind of goes away, um, and not only from the perspective of your individual companies, but what's a successful 2021? That's a tough one, I know. Mike? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you one. It's, it's got a little bit of a selfish nuance to it, but I'll, I'll keep this, the, the, the selfish nuance to myself. Um, success in 2021 for me would be that the entire village commits to putting the consumer and the employee first. I'll give you an example. Um, we're coming through open enrollment cycle and uh, there were a lot of benefit decisions put on hold because employer groups just had to get through fourth quarter and figure out how to manage the work from home environment and new policies as it pertains to leaves and furloughs. And, and, and let's just get through this time and, and we'll catch our breath in 2021. What we're wired to do is catch our breath in the fall of 2021, next open enrollment cycle. So to me, success will be that the village says, maybe we should challenge that status quo a little bit. Maybe we should think about, maybe we can implement a benefit or a change in April, because at the end of the day, it's gonna benefit the consumer and the employee, right? Um, so that would be what I define as success. And it's gonna require us to get a little bit outside of our comfort zone, but I think 2020, helped us figure out how to do that. So uh, um, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, that's my wish. No, nothing like altruistic selfishness. Good, good job, Mike. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll lift off of that. I, you know, I think um, we have an opportunity to build back better as a society, um, not to just go back to where we were, but to think of where we'd like to be and, and use where we're at now as a springboard to go there. Um, my hope and, and to some degree prediction is, is that I think we as a society will figure that out um, and you know, think about solutions that say, hey, if we were to build the America that we want, how would we do it? Mm. Um, not not how, how can we get back to where we were in February 2020? Yeah, I like that. Scott, finish it off. I'd like to repeat exactly what Veer said. <laughs> That's just perfect. Um, for me, 2021 would be a success if we really kind of throw out the prior norms. I think 2020, despite its challenges, has galvanized a lot of people to reach out and care. We do meetings like this all the time, and to a degree, I feel closer to folks. There is certainly a, a greater degree of candor in our conversations than pre-COVID. Um, oftentimes, uh, as an industry, we would take up meetings and just simply be on a phone call. Now you've got the look and feel, and I hope people take sort of the silver lining of 2020, which is these connections with people, and carry it forward to the new norm that uh, Ear was talking about a moment ago. Here, here, I like that. What a great way to finish off this particular conversation. Uh, Veer and Mike from Brella, Scott from Greenhouse slash RGAX. Um, I, I just, I love these wellness, health related conversations. I think. I think you guys are right. I think 2020 is galvanizing. I think people have opened their eyes and um, they're going to be a large swath of our fellow uh, countrymen and women who are going to decide um, things have to change and they're gonna, we're going to start making a, a better society. Let us hope so anyway. So um, with that, uh, Veer, Mike, Scott, thank you so much. I appreciate the conversation. Um, I, you, I, learned, I learned so much. I hope the audience did as well. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Yeah. So we're still in COVID time. So everyone still be careful, wash your hands, wear a mask. <laughs> it's not that hard. So for Veer, for Mike, for Scott, my name is Nick. Um, thanks again, everyone. And until next time, be safe. Thank you. I have a dream that one day, this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that 